Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Blog. And today we're going to talk about Namar 1 through 5 donated to us by our friend Cam Frazier. Cam, thank you so much for these issues. I really do appreciate it. Uh, these are the five issues of uh, the King and Black miniseries for Namar. And uh, they all came out written by Kurt Busiek and Benjamin Dewey, who did the art on all five issues. And I like the art. Uh, there are times where I liked it a lot more than others. I felt like some of the art was a little inconsistent, but that happens in comics sometimes, even from the best of artists, because... I mean, schedules, you know, like you have to get these things out there really quickly. And some pages, you're going to have to rely on your inkers a little bit more, or you're going to have to rely on the colorist a little bit more to make what minimal art is there to pop. Um, so it's very collaborative. It's it's a lot of hard work, obviously. And uh, it's definitely a, a, ta a talent I don't have is drawing monthly comics. So, um, so you know, I'm, I try to be a, a little lenient, uh, but I always be honest with like the aesthetics of the art and what appeals to me. And uh, I do like Benjamin's line work. I think some of the line works are really clean and look really good. Um, but then there's some, and then there's times where he's like adds at least some outlines of characters in the background to make the background feel fuller. But I don't know if he's doing that or if, you know, um, one of his, uh, if Jonas Scharf is doing it, who says they're listed as present day sequence artist. Um, so that's obviously the, the present day stuff. Like, uh, but, uh, but some of that looked a little like um, rough around the edges. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. Like, I don't know. But it looks like they maybe ink their own stuff and uh, they have, uh, you know, color, a color that, uh, a different color. So it looks like Benjamin and Jonas, uh, they, uh, I guess, ink their own stuff because they're listed just as artists and not as inker and um, uh, not as penciler and inker and stuff. So um, anyway, so this five issue miniseries is set present day. So there's like some of present day. So we'll talk about Jonas's work first here where the book opens up and it kind of has um, something happen at the bottom of the ocean in this one specific area of the ocean. And people are coming up and warning Namar about it. And so Namar is going down and he gets into like a station and, uh, and he's like, we, you know, they're like, we sent in guards and they're all dead. And he's like, oh, great. He's like, I know what's here. And so he's kind of alluding to what's down here. And then you're cutting back to the past and you're going back like 90 years or so, um, like right around the time before World War One, I, I think it was. And Namar is younger. He's, you know, he's a, he's a prince, a young prince still. Um, but he uh, hasn't, you know, his father is still around and, and there's still like a uh, more unity in the, all the ocean clans, you know, um, between all the different families and stuff and royalties. So, uh, so there's a little bit more unity down there and there's a lot more Atlanteans cause like modern day is like, they kind of whittled them down a little bit. Um, and so Namar is working with, uh, or he's a, like I said, he's a kid. So he has like his close friends and like their pu little puffer fish friend and they're like, you know, have their own points of view on things and Namar's not quite arrogant yet but then he meets this uh, group called like the rising tide or something and uh and they're this group of badass warriors from another royal family and they're a little arrogant and a little pompous and they you know come over and meet Namar and you know it's like the, the meetings of the family so he's a prince and he meets them because they're kind of royalty one of them's a prince I think and uh and then he has this other friend who's you know uh, lined up to uh, possibly be royalty too so there's all these like people, all these setups. Unfortunately, I don't remember all the characters' names because Namar, my, I guess my knowledge of Namar is um, the early Fantastic Four books, which I've read a dozen times. Um, and then probably like some of the stuff during um, the Illuminati storyline where he's part of like a, a brain trust of uh, people like Reed Richards and Professor X and Hank McCoy and stuff like, and, and T'Challa. Like I remember him in that era. But I, I don't have a lot of knowledge of this character outside of those two things. So his this a lot of this was kind of new to me, just like Atlantis Rising was a little bit new to me. Um, so uh, so it, I kind of like that, though. Like, I like kind of broadening my Marvel horizons. Because with DC, I'm more of a, an encyclopedia for DC stuff. With Marvel, I have a lot of pockets of things I don't know about. <laughs> uh, so, like, there's, like I, ha I read them by runs. So, like, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby run. Fantastic Four, awesome. Read that run a dozen times. Uh, but then, like, most things after that for Fantastic Four, not so much. <laughs> so, so again, I have all these pockets, like, missing and stuff. Uh, so, um, so for this story, though, we have everyone meeting up, you know, and the, they're meeting the, the these Tide, uh, this group called the Tide, um, and they're badasses. Uh, you know, they're total badasses. And so when enemies show up to attack them while they're all, like, having this meeting, people who are against the unity of, you know, these uh, families uniting and stuff under the sea because it might be too much power, you know, there'll be united power and stuff, and there are factions that d of people underwater that don't want that. Um, they're like coming in to fight and the, the tide just kill them all <laughs> like like brutally kill them um and they have like this uh, there's like a legendary sea dragon down there that you're seeing for the first time and in, in the lore and stuff um 
and uh, and it just has you know it just goes from battle to battle, and you see like this young Namar working with these people, and then at the end the king decides, you know what, these enemies that attacked us they came from somewhere out there. We just need to abolish them if we can just wipe them out um, because they 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 literally came here, they killed some of us when we're just having a celebration, um, you know, so we need to go and like take them out. And so I'm going to send the tide, but I'm also sending my son, you know, Prince Namar and his friend and her puffer fish and like his other friend, um, like he's like, I'm sending you guys all out and you go, you know, uh, find, find these people and take them down. So, uh, so, you know, Namar's like, Hey, this is awesome. I get to go hang with these badass fighters. Maybe I'll learn some things. And he does, he learns some combat techniques, um, he, from them as they go through and they're like demolishing. There's a guy called the mountain and he's like smashing people together. Um, and there's like this woman on the team who knows magic. There's this one scene where they show up and there's like a, a jellyfish type squid because you can kind of see through it. And there's three humanoid bodies inside of it with glowing skulls that are like telekinetically operating the the squid and i'm like that is amazing what an amazing visual and concept and it's literally destroyed in one page and i'm just like i i don't get it like the some of the stuff that these writers feel like are cool that they should like like hey this is a cool thing we gotta spend time on this um, and then the things that actually are cool that they spend no time on. <laughs> I've noticed that a little bit in Valkyries, and I noticed that here with Kurt Busiek in this. And I like Kurt Busiek. He's a phenomenal writer. Um, so I'm just surprised, because that, to me, like, they have, like, three battles in issue two. I'm like, why couldn't all three battles be against this, this giant squid monster with three people inside of it like that would have been cool uh and then like maybe one at a time one of the people come out and they're like they have a different power and you know i'm like you could have really fleshed out that concept and made it really cool um i think i think it's because i i think of things in video game form too sometimes like a uh, final fantasy or um resident evil like those games have like these different types of creatures that you fight so like there's these great animators and, and people that work on these games that like come up with the concepts of all these monsters this felt like something that I'm like, if you developed that more, I could see one day if they ever make a Namor movie, that they would probably pull that concept and go like, we need to have this monster that was in one issue of Namor in this movie, because it's just visually amazing to see an x-ray version of a, a, a squid with three people inside of it with glowing skull heads, like just cool looking like it just was really cool. So I was really upset that it was brushed over in like a page. <laughs> um, but uh and then we never see anything like that for the rest of the five issues. I'm like, come on, that's a cool concept. I don't know, whatever. Maybe that's just me. Um, but so you have this woman on the on the tide that learns magic, and she talks about the old ones. So it's kind of like a Cthulhu reference kind of thing, where these old these old gods and stuff, and uh, and everyone is. Um, and then you have like a story, or then they're all uniting. They they took down the the evil, you know, evil people. I, I mean, people who are trying to lead a revolution or trying to prevent. A government from having too much power i mean i don't know are, are they that bad i guess it's a perspective thing so so to me i'm like those people just get decimated <laughs> by the tide um like they're nothing and i'm like oh well, all right i guess we'll just uh you know i guess we're seeing this through namar's eyes and they want the unity so i guess that's why it's like that um but they actually cut to the surface and and have a, a von strucker story so it's like a descendant of uh, baron von strucker and he's working with someone named Cravenoff, uh, like a, a descendant of Craven the Hunter. And so that's a little thing in there that I was like, hey, that's neat. And they don't really touch on that too much either. Um, so there was just, I don't know, there's a lot of things in there. I was like, these are cool setups. And I imagine it's because maybe one at one point, Kurt Busiek might, maybe there is a Namor series out now that I just don't even know about that's continuing this. I don't know. But uh, but it seems like Kurt Busiek is like trying to add all this lore to these early days and early adventures. And we talk about that all the time. Every Most comic writers now come in and they want to add new origins or they want to put twists on stories that already been told because then they want to feel like they have ownership over those stories. And sometimes that's not a writer's choice. It's like an editorial mandate where they're like, hey, well, like let's go back and tell an early story of young Prince Namar and you can literally do whatever you want, set up any kind of lore you want, bring in, like talk about the old gods, like you can do all these things. And, and again, I don't know a ton about the lore of Namor, so maybe some of this was already there and he's just building off of it. But that's what I mean. A lot of writers nowadays come in and they want to put their stamps 
on these things, especially at Marvel, because in case movies do get made, they want that special thanks credit. They want things pulled from their stories. And, uh, and so that's, that's why, you know, that's why they do it sometimes. And I'm like, well, if that's your reasoning, I, I am not a fan of that, but if you still make it a good story, I'll support it, you know? Um, and again, good is subjective. So what I think is good, you might not. So, um, but this I felt like was interesting. And like I said, since some, I'm someone who doesn't know a ton about Namar's lore, um, I kind of found this neat, but while they're under the water, um, fighting back some, uh, the lady who casts magic and she's talking about the old ones and the old gods, something awakens and this like these symbiote slivers come through and remember this takes place like in world war one right before world war one so somehow these symbiotes come from under the water through this portal thing i guess uh from Noel, i guess and they possess um i don't know maybe it's not even Noel. maybe it's just another old god like Noel. i don't know but they talk kind of like Noel. like their bubbles the speech bubbles are black with white text and stuff although Noel's are red so maybe it is a different thing um, but they get kind of possessed, and so now the the, the tide is now called the Black Tide, and uh, and now they're the enemies. So you set them. They did a good job. Like Kirby did a good job setting them up as these badasses that like like indiscriminately kill things. Like if you point them at a direction, they just go and kill everything that direction, and they're badasses. Uh, but before they got turned, like some of them showed Namar some combat moves, and the lady who knows magic showed Namar's friends some magic spells and things. Um, so they became friends with them, and then now they have to fight their friends. And so that's what the rest of the book is. It's basically modern day stuff, and then cutting back to the Von Strucker Kravinoff thing, and then uh, and then cutting to down to Atlantis and seeing um, you know uh, the the Black Tide just going from one of you know underwater village to the next, just decimating everyone, trying to go back to where Namar's from and where they all originated from. So it's kind of like a monomyth storyline where everyone leaves their home and they go fight a battle out there and then things go wrong and now they have to come back home to like save home. And pretty much what I wrote in my, my comic book monomyth, that's pretty much the story structure. So that's what Kurt Busiek's doing here. But along the way, you know, he, like I said, he has, uh, Namar has these friends that lose people they love. They're puffer fish. They're looking for some uh, like stone, like some ancient stone that might give them the edge to uniting the families. And they also don't want it to fall into the wrong hands. So they're more or less going out there, not just to kill and pillage these, uh, these, uh, protesters or whatever they are um these these re re uh, rebel people but they're also just trying to get that stone so at least like hey even if we don't kill all of them we'll have the stone and they just they won't bother us after that because we'll, have, we'll, have, we'll definitely have too much power and so uh so there's that stone is out there and their puffer fish ends up eating it and uh to to safely transport it back to their uh home and in doing so it mutated the puffer fish into a bigger monster so when the uh namar's friend the girl who learned the magic spell when she grabs the stone at the end to to cast a magic spell from it it ends up mutating her a little bit so she has to like sacrifice some something to save help save everything and then namar is using those fighting techniques to fight against the black tide and stuff like that so um so yeah it's pretty much just like friends versus friends and in the end you have this big battle back in a, a you know atlantis um where namar and his father are and they're trying to protect the city and protect the stone uh, against these creatures and what ends up doing is the the girl who learned the magic spell she didn't learn any lethal magic spells she only learned how to you know um trap uh someone so she uses the stone and casts the magic spell and it just traps everyone down at the bottom of the ocean all the black tide members so they're still possessed they're still brainwashed and they're just now trapped at the bottom of the ocean um so that's pretty much the story and i'm sorry if you hear the the weed whacker outside uh normally they don't do uh uh you know uh, uh landscaping stuff here on this day but uh but apparently today they decided to do it because they probably knew that I was filming something. Um, so anyway, so that's all takes place in the past. And then the sacrifice the girl makes where she's, uh, where she uses the stone to like uh, trap all those, you know, the, the black tide down at the bottom of the ocean. She's mutated, like I said, but then her puffer fish comes and absorbs the mutation. So her puffer fish becomes even more mutated and now she's back to being beautiful again. And I'm like, ah, so her sacrifice, I mean, she was willing to make the sacrifice and give up her beauty. Um, but she, but in the end, it got retconned anyway, because I guess she exists in Namar lore, so they can't have her all of a sudden be a creature out of nowhere. Um, but I, I don't know. I still would have liked it to where she still ended as a like a little like a monster. And then Namar say to her, don't worry, we're going to we're going to have the best people come and we're going to work on this. And then you could tell a story where, you know, there's maybe there's still a friendship there. Or she's in love with her a little bit, but she's like, you know, uh, has been mutated. But he, you know, again, I'm going back to the Valkyrie thing a little bit or the, the Beta Ray Bill thing, but uh, from the previous episode. But 
I don't know. I think those are neat stories, you know, like uh, <laughs> I think he could have done something there. Um, but everything's kind of just wrapped up with a little bow at the end. But then, of course, you cut back to present day and that's when you realize, oh, and by the way, the Von Strucker guy and the Kravinoff guy, I think they die like in an explosion or something when the um, black tide arise or whatever. Um, or one of them gets away or something. I can't remember. Uh, but it's, they're not that important to the story. Like they kind of are part of a setup to a story, but they kind of get fiddled, fiddled away. And I think it's just more or less having just Marvel references, uh, really. Um, because I felt like even though they added something to the story with the, the facility they were in and what they were working on and the kind of messing with the dimension stuff, I thought that was that helps the story. But it also kind of was like, well, it, it, it literally just it was there. So the Black Tide can kind of become the Black Tide, really. Um, but in the end, it cuts back to modern day and Namor gets to the bottom of the ocean because remember in present day, he's looking out and he, you know, his friends are like, oh, we sent a team in and they got killed. So he's like, all right, I'll go in and investigate. So he goes in and all of his team, all the team are dead and all these floating bodies all around and where the black tide was trapped under the water, they're now free. And so Namor says, okay, they're free in the modern world. Um, and he goes, and so I guess I'm just going to have to keep an eye out for them because they're probably going to study the world, figure out our strengths, our weaknesses, you know, study our heroes, and then they'll probably attack. And then the book ends. And I was like, wait, so, so wait, are they tied to Noel or not? And if they are, Noel was just defeated. So are they not possessed anymore? And that's what makes me think they're probably part of some different old gods. Um, and I think the story kind of says that, but I, I kind of, I probably just not remembering it correctly. Um, but but still, I was kind of like, wow, what a kind of an anticlimactic <laughs> ending in a way. So uh, so that's how the book ends. So yeah, so now we're in present day, and maybe Kurt Busiek will come in and, and launch a new Namar book um, where he picks up this thread and he builds towards uh, the Black Tide. Um, that I don't know, could be interesting, but uh, but who knows? You know, I, do I want a, a story that takes place in Namar that sets up another big crossover event? where uh, Marvel characters have to fight old gods from uh, be the beginning of time, like they did with Null, and would have, have they do pretty pretty often, act actually, Galactus and all these other things. Uh, no, I don't want another story like that, <laughs> not really. Um, and I didn't find the Black Tide that interesting. Uh, but then again, this was just one series, so maybe you could flesh them out more in another series. But, uh, but I don't know, this was an okay book. Again, like most of these tie-ins, they're coherent stories like they're not like a, I think only a couple of them I felt like were a, a real mess but only a few I mean most of these aren't bad like um, these are good writers Kurt Busiek's a good writer Jason Aaron although I don't like his Avengers stuff you know and, and some of his other stuff he's done before like he's a good writer structurally he can he can pace things out and work on things and so you know so I have I, but I'm I'm mixed I feel like sometimes these writers they are good actually there's some of them can even be great but they just do good and I, and that always frustrates me because I'm like you have so much talent uh, to to do better, and uh, and and yet you know like I don't know um, like Kurt Busiek he's done so many cool things I don't I don't know if I would ask him to do a King in Black tie-in uh, I think I would have just said like hey do a Namar book and then just make this Namar and not put the King in Black logo on it because like I said it, it even though it deals with possessed uh, you know Black Tide members. It doesn't really, and they mentioned Null, I think, like once or twice, but like, because it, it's pre some of the, some of it's in present day, but it's like, other than that, it's like, do you really need this to be a King in Black thing? Like, no, you really don't. So much like um, the Beta Ray Bill book and this, like, you just really don't need the King in Black logo on them. Um, so that just frustrates me even more from, uh, you know, the editors of King in Black, uh, the group editors and the people who are putting that together, because it's clear they were just like, just slap logos on things that might not sell. But I'm like, hey, man, if you got I, I think the art on this book was pretty good, but um, it's Kurt Busiek. Like, uh, you know, I don't know. I would have just trusted in that and, and done a Namar number one and just have him set up his you know story. I don't know. Uh, but that's just me. Um, but as the frustrating sound of the the, the wind blower outside now and now he switched from weed whacker to 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 a leaf blower. Um, now that that's picking up, I'm going to end the episode, but, uh, let me know what you think. Uh, first of all, Cam Fraser, thank you for these issues. I, I, you know, overall, like I said, I'm enjoying what I'm reading. I don't feel like any of these have really been a waste of my time, except maybe the main King and Black series. Like, I think the main five issues of that, there's been a couple moments in it, but ultimately I, I really thought that was the weakest out of a lot of stuff. Cause some of these tie-ins at least are telling, like I said, coherent beginning, middle and end stories. Even if some of them are kind of generic or some of them have dad jokes forced into them or whatever. They're still like uh, 
telling a story. And uh, and the King in Black one, I just felt like it told a story, kind of, but it was all over the place. Like, every issue just felt like a mess, and it didn't seem to have a lot of focus to it. And this event in general, I think, had less focus to it than, um, than Absolute Carnage did. And so for that, that just shows me that the editors of these books and, and Donny Cates himself, like, to me, they got lazier. They got lazier with uh, their creativity, and that's a shame because I think they have a ton of creativity, and I think we as fans deserve better. Wow, he's right outside my window now. <laughs> All right, so that's it for me. Um, I'm going to go back under the water so I can get away from this noise. So uh, I will see you all later. Thank you so much for watching the episode. Let me know what you think of these issues down below, and we'll continue our conversation, as always, down there. Thanks so much. See you in the future. Peace.